last year at the um, International ALS meeting, um, we gave this prize that we give every year to scientists who study repair and regeneration. And we gave it to Neil Schneider from Columbia for developing this gene therapy for this mutation called FUS, F-U-S. And the first, one of the girls, because she was a teenager when she started, um, one of the people he treated came and she went from being in a wheelchair to walking. And so wow. she walked up on the stage. And uh, I think the whole room was in standing ovation. It was pretty remarkable. So that, that, that's what tells me it's possible even in, in later stages of the illness. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Hello, everyone. Today's episode is going to be a different format from what we normally do. One of the most common questions that gets sent to us is people asking about ALS. They ask about fundraising, new medicines, and what the future holds. Our goal today is to have a very transparent ALS update while also mixing in some of the most common questions. So without further ado, Merritt, what do we understand about the causes of ALS? That, that's a great question. We, we understand a lot more than we used to. So we know that there are some changes in the genes that, that make everything in our body that can cause some forms of ALS. Um, so maybe 15% of people with ALS, will their, their illness is caused by a mutation in the, in the gene in their, in their DNA, in their genetic code. For the other 85%, we think it's multiple things that happen through their lifetime. And, and it could be five or six things that happen to them. And what makes it hard to know exactly for a person what happens is, is that it could be five or six different things per each person. So some of the risk factors, for example, are um, related to head trauma, uh, to um, being exposed to, you know, like pesticides. So it's more common like in, in farmers or welders. Um, you know, those are just a few. But um, we definitely think that it's, it's more than one thing that happens to someone over their lifetime. So the sporadic, of the sporadic, you said it's roughly 15% genetic and 85 sporadic. Of the sporadic, is there a breakdown there? Or do we know, like, is it majority or head trauma or majority? I know one thing is like smoking or um, things like, uh, I think, marathon runners or military people, high stress on the nervous system. Is there like a breakdown of that 85%? Is there one thing that stands out? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, a little bit. We, I mean, we know that the um, sports related or maybe the head trauma stuff is a is a big risk factor. So in some studies, it's like a fourfold increase or a sixfold increase, which is pretty big, as opposed to things like you know smoking might increase your risk two times. Um, so I, I, I think we know that kind of stuff. The other thing is, you know, they study you know, identical twins where one person gets ALS and the other one either does or doesn't. And they, when they study identical twins with ALS, it can tell us how much of the illness is caused by genetic changes, even in sporadic form. And when they do those studies, they think that 50% of ALS, even in, in what we call sporadic, is still related to the genes your body carries that put you at risk for it. Wait, I didn't know there were twins. That's crazy. So there's a twin. Like, I always say I wish I had, although I guess I wish I had a twin with ALS so that one of us could take the medication and one couldn't to see what's changing. You know, like I always wish there was some kind of benchmark, but if there's one twin without ALS and one with, that's fascinating. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, 
there's about you know um, twenty or thirty kind of pairs that people have been studying. You know, um, Amara over in, in UK, Bob Brown here, and from that they can tell that um, you know if both of them always got it, it'd be hundred percent genetic, but it's it's more like half. So that tells us there's some there's even in people where there's no one else in the family, you know, half the reason you have it is is encoded in your genes, and so mm-hmm. people are trying to figure out what those are so they can you know get drugs to, to target those. It makes a lot of sense too, because a lot of times people will say like things with my dad with tied to football, they'll be like, well, this player, you know, hit a million times and they don't have it. So it can't all be football. So it is interesting that it's that combination, I guess, of factors plus genetics. This is why we keep you yeah. around, Merritt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a lot, you know, there are a lot of illnesses where is that gene environmental kind of interaction. Yeah. If, if you, if you get, and this is kind of related, but not really. If you're, if you get ALS, are you more like likely to get one of those other neuro, neurodegenerative diseases, or maybe are you less likely? Like, if you get ALS, can you then also get, I don't know, Parkinson's? Or you better say no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> so that would be really bad. I mean, sometimes oh the two happen, but it's it's just by chance. We they think. The only illness that's a little more common in ALS uh, is the something called frontal temporal dysfunction, which which we can see sometimes in ALS, but not not in everybody. Okay, I didn't know if like if you had those genes that made you more susceptible to one, you're more susceptible to all. I feel like I hear a lot about um, autoimmune diseases in people with ALS. I don't know if that's like studied in terms of statistics, but it seems like a lot of the people I know also have or had an autoimmune disease that they were managing and then got diagnosed with ALS. Yeah, I think you're right, Brooke. There, there, there have been some reports about that and also like thyroid disease. And now that there's, you know, all this big data, that's what everybody's talking about. You, you can you can do those studies and see, you know, if, if, if it really is more common in people with ALS. That's like a thing too with People, um, when you get diagnosed, first get diagnosed, everyone says like test for Lyme's disease and things like that. And that's like the number one comment that used to pop on my dad's stuff. They're like, no, you don't have ALS. You just have Lyme's disease. Yeah, it's nonstop. Where does that come from, Mara? I'm, I'm smiling because, uh, Tim, you like to ask me the controversial questions. Last time you asked me about the Harvard president, and now I get Lyme. <laughs> Not that they're equal, but. We're um, doing Mara next, Merritt. Look out. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I it, well, I'd say obviously we don't know, but I don't think Lyme is a big cause of ALS just because it's been looked at. But you know, someone may be likely to get ALS. Maybe five things already happen, and then the sixth one might be getting Lyme disease. That that's a possibility. It's just very hard to prove. I always tell people to just get treated if they think they have got Lyme disease. You know, get the antibiotic course and kind of put the question to rest. What is actually happening to your body when you have ALS? Uh, maybe I can answer, but then Brooke, obviously, yeah. uh, you're, you got you know. this one. Um, <laughs> so you know the, the you know the technical answer is you know there are these nerves that that control your your muscles uh, called motor nerves, and they're the ones that are damaged. And when they're damaged, they don't give the signal to your muscle to move as it should, or they don't provide the nutrition your muscles need. So people um, get uh, weakness or, um, in their arms or their legs or their you know, speaking and, and they might lose, their muscles might get thinner. Um, but we're, we know the problem is in those motor nerves that control how you move. Um, and when they're not working well, then there's a domino effect. The cells around them, you know, aren't working, uh, what we call the glial cells. So it ends up being lots of parts of the brain and spinal cord involved, but the primary problem is those motor nerves to your muscles. And Mary, what, why does, why for some people is their legs and some people is their arms and like why why does it affect people differently? Is that just the type of ALS that you have, or is it something else? Yeah, that we we actually don't know why it starts in like a hand for somebody, a foot for somebody else, and and and, and speech for someone else. It's a really good question, but it's um, so we don't know if it's really actually kind of random or if it's if it's tied into the type of biology that somebody has. Is it random for both genetic and sporadic? 
for the most part, I mean, I'd say there's some genes, like let's say the SOD1, which is the first one that was discovered, that tends to um, start in the in the limbs, in the hand or arm, L- less likely to start with the bulbar. But the C9, another one, another gene, that one tends to be more common to start in bulbar, but, but you can see people with, with limb onset. So it, it is not, there's no clear answer. I say when, when people ask me, I, I am about a fourth as smart based on our last episode of the SAT scores, about as fourth as smart as Merit. <laughs> but when people ask me, I say like the message goes out, but no one's home to hear it is basically, right? Because your, your brain, it's sending the message out to move it, but those motor neurons aren't bringing it to the muscle to actually tell it that. Yeah, yeah I think that's a good way to describe it. I don't know if that's how it feels, Brooke, or- um, it's a weird feeling. I think I, it's similar to how Troy just said, I usually think of it as like you're flipping on a light switch, but the wire is cut. So the light bulb doesn't go on. Like I'm still flipping the switch. Like I'm still, my brain is still working where I can say like move foot, but the wiring just won't let it happen. So it's a weird feeling. It's like, it's, it's got to be one of the weirdest juxtapositions of having a normal functioning brain, but a non functioning body. Cause like every day I wake up and I'm like, I should be able to hop out of bed. Like I remember two years ago I was walking and now I just like, it. it's like my legs are made of cement. Now it's bizarre. It's a really strange thing to wrap That's- your head around. I saw a video you did, Brooke, where somebody was asking um, what it felt like, and you had like them put their hand on the table with the ring finger. Yeah. And it's so funny because I had never heard that before, and I did it. And and the. Uh, Have you heard this, face- Merit? No, no. Tell me. Okay, so take take your fist, and I think tuck your thumb in, and then if you put it like this on the surface, Palm and down. then extend your ring finger. Oh yeah. And try to lift it. Like every yeah. other finger you can lift, but for some reason your ring finger just you're like, please just won't do it. No matter how much effort. Yeah. Like you yeah. can like make yourself sweat trying to make it work and it's just not working. Yeah. That's how my yeah. first symptom of my foot felt. I was like, I'm telling it to do something, but it's just not responding. It's hard because like when my dad was telling me about it, how he's like I'm telling, I'm telling it to move. Cause when he was early on, he's like, I'm telling my leg to move and it is moving, but it's not moving the way it should. It was like, it's hard to try to like rationalize it in a brain, unless you're feeling that it's a very yeah. bizarre thing to try to imagine what that feels like. And then when you did that hand down and try and move your ring finger, that kind of gave me that, I don't know. I kind of was like, oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah. It's, it's like, it, like my nieces and nephew who are all under 12, still can't quite grasp that I can feel still like they are always pinching my legs and they're like, you can't feel that. Right. And I'm like, I can. And I've told you that a hundred times, but like, it doesn't make sense to them. They're like, how can you feel this, but you can't move it. And that it's confusing to me too, even though it's my body. Like I, I don't get it either. I think they're just messing with you and like to pinch you. I agree. I think they've like all agreed. (laughs) that's, That's just their excuse, but. See how much longer it lasts. <laughs> Sometimes I get people talking to me like I'm mentally not there. They get close and talk very loud and slow and say, Tim, can you hear me? Can Tim hear me? That can be a little frustrating. And it's not a, no one does it with any bad intent. People are just, they're, they're trying to be um, considerate. They just don't know. I mean, ALS is a thing. I, I didn't, I, I never did that to anybody. I think I'd be too, uh, intimidated socially to do it but i never i didn't know anything about als until i heard a little bit about the ice bucket challenge and a little bit about steve gleason so i wouldn't have known either if i you know but i get it is a i think it's just an education thing yeah i don't think people ever really know what to say like and i don't blame them because it's like i don't think i would know what to say but so i get a lot of people being like like one guy walked up to me at the train station once, some stranger and was like, you know, I just want to say like, you've got a great smile. You obviously have a lot going on. And I just wanted to say, you seem really happy. And I like my friend turned to me and was just cracking up. Cause she was like, man, people just 
you can tell they start the sentence and then immediately regret starting it. They're like, how do I finish this without sounding like an idiot? It's a tough situation. They're, they're, they mean well, but they just, a lot of times it's a, I don't know. It's, it's hard too. Cause you want, it's like, you want people to still approach people and talk to them. And, but it is, it is, uh, I don't know. It's like a little risky when you're, <laughs> somebody has something going on that you walk up. It's usually the kids who will humble you the fastest, like, cause they don't care. Like my friend's yeah. kids who are like three and four come up to me and they're like, why, why don't you move? I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm trying. <laughs> They're like, why aren't you getting in the pool with me? I'm like, uh, you would have to save me at four years old. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's that raw honesty. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. I love hearing the kids' questions because you never know what you're going to get. You, you kind of, like Brooke, on your Instagram, you're just like, ask me any question. I won't get offended. And people write some crazy, crazy questions in there. Yeah. I feel like most of them are pretty respectful like I I rarely get offended by them um I actually never get offended by questions the the ones I get offended by are people being like you should be sad or you should be blank like they act like they would know how they would react if it was them and I'm like you never know how you're going to react like I wouldn't have expected you know my reaction versus anyone else's reaction so those are the only comments that kind of like irk me but questions, like I'll take any kind of question. Merritt, what are the most exciting recent discoveries and treatments in the ALS pipeline? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of good things in the pipeline. So, um, but I'd say if I had to, if I had to pick, I'd, I'd say there's there's two or three companies that have approaches to target this protein called TDP43, which is very important in ALS. So it's a protein that's in the wrong place in the motor neuron. And it's um, also aggregated. And there's a, a couple approaches in development to um, get rid of the aggregates and also to return the TDP43 to the right place of the cell. And those things give me hope because they're really getting at what we think is the, the fundamental biology of it. And it's never really been tested. So, you know, I think in 2025, we'll see a few of those TDP43 type drugs uh, go into clinical trials. So that that's one one broad area. Uh, and I like that there's a couple of companies working on different ways to do it uh, because we, we don't know what the best way is yet. And then another approach, and this is work by um, Jeff Rostein at Hopkins and other people, is we think that the reason TDP43 is in the wrong place is because there's a leakiness in, in the part of the cell that contains your genetic material. It's called a nuclear pore leak. And he, with other people, has figured out how to kind of plug that leak. And so they're developing a drug to try to fix that nuclear pore leakage. So these these ideas are just so new and it's new technology and uh um, that it's moving that fast, it, it might be in people next year. It gives me a lot of hope. So those are those are a few. Mary, what what would happen if they did if the protein moved back to the right spot? Would those would the, all the motor neuron cells just start working again? Yeah, that's the hope. Yeah, I, I mean we I, we don't know until they try it, but the we know um, some from some recent trials that if you can actually fix the problem, people can get better. And that, that's what we really learned in like 2023 and 2024 with, with some of the gene therapy trials where they used gene therapy technology to turn off the gene that was causing the illness. And we saw some people get remarkably better. So that kind of tells us the nerves are still there, you know, and that maybe they're not connected to the uh, muscle or the, the message isn't getting through, but they're still there. And if you can stop the damage, they can repair they can either sprout or repair or start functioning again. And, you know, that, that's such a new thing in, in our field. It gives a lot, of, a lot of hope. If if that does happen, if if that were to fix it, somebody like, and Brooke and my dad are both in very different spots in their ALS journey, you know, will would people get, you know, 50% back, 10% back? Is there any estimate on what, like if somebody like Brooke, would she be able to walk again? Whereas somebody like my dad maybe wouldn't be able to, but he could breathe on his own. Is there any estimate like that? If, if it were, if the TDP you know, were fixed, if that, how much could come back, I guess? 
Yeah. And, you know, they're really good questions. And that's, that's why we got to work on repair and regeneration, but I, I don't think we know yet, but, but, um, from those other gene therapy trials, we do know that maybe the, the fastest, biggest response did happen and people got the drugs early, but they still saw some uh, response um, in people who were uh, much farther along in the illness. So I, I think there's, there's a hope. It, maybe it'll just take a little longer. So for the genetic version, when, when they're treating them, I mean, what are they seeing patients go from, is it people who are in a wheelchair or walking again? Is it that drastic? Well, you know, last last year at the um, international ALS meeting, um, we gave this prize that we give every year to scientists who study repair and regeneration. We gave it to Neil Schneider from Columbia for developing this gene therapy for this mutation called FUS, F-U-S. And the first one of the girls, because she was a teenager when she started, um, one of the people he treated came and she went from being in a wheelchair to walking. And wow. so she walked up on the stage and uh, I think the whole room was in standing ovation. It was pretty remarkable. So that, that, that's what tells me it's possible even in, in later stages of the illness. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It was really amazing. We got to figure this out. We got to figure out how to stop it and then how to accelerate the repair process. Brooke, has your ALS journey brought you any closer to religion? When we spoke on episode five, you were still on the fence about it. We had Lee Strobel, a very well-known Christian writer, on last week. If you're still unsure, I recommend reading some of his stuff. Not really. I mean, I feel like I kind of have my own um, version of religion because I never really, like, I didn't grow up going to church. I think we went to church like three times and my dad would be off golfing. So my mom would be stuck with us at church and she said, None of the three kids wanted to go. So she was like, I'm not doing this to myself while you go golf. So we never went. Um, But I feel like I I have like, like I believe in an afterlife. I I have a lot of beliefs, but I think they're just sort of made up from my own life and learnings as opposed to like following a, a religion purely. So kind of a non answer, but sort of. Are you, are you more, I'll say, uh, I'll say spiritual. Are you more spiritual today than you were pre ALS? I probably think about it more just cause I'm thinking about like life and death more and like meaning more. Um, so I probably think about it more than I used to. I'm glad to hear that you're at least thinking about it. You're on the right path. Brooke, can you talk about how your symptoms have changed since you were last on the podcast? I don't even remember when we talked last. I feel like it was like December, January ish. That's I was trying to think of that too. I think it was I, I think it was after that, but not I think it was around then. Yeah. I think it was like February, March. Okay. Um so what's changed since a lot, unfortunately, but I guess to be expected. So my breathing decreased. Um like end of May, it was actually on Mother's Day, I felt like I was not getting a deep breath. And I was like, am I having like a panic attack? What's going on? And so I booked, they booked me for like a full pulmonology exam. And my breathing went from like a 97 to a 71 in three months, like it was fast. Um, So they gave me a BiPAP, I try to use it every night although I cannot fall asleep with it. Everyone else seems to be able to, except for me. I'm still trying. Um, Two months in, I'm still not able to do it. I was able to do it once, but I had taken NyQuil that night. So I don't know, maybe that's my new plan. Um, (laughs) And then in the last like three weeks, my arms and my hands and my neck, have started to feel like significantly weaker all at once, which is not something I'm used to dealing with because I like historically it was like, one foot, one calf, one thigh, the second foot, the like it was one at a time. And it let me kind of like digest it. Um, Whereas now like, I don't like my neck just like hurts from holding it up. So I keep like trying to, you probably saw me like fidgeting at the beginning. I'm trying to like always figure out how to get it comfortable. Um, Also my wheelchair is broken because an airline dropped it. So it might just be my positioning, but my hands and my neck don't feel great at the moment. Not not a great 
a lot of changes. None, none are good. The wheelchair breaking is like a very real fear that we have the same. We, every time we're on the plane, we are like, there's no way it would happen, but it's, it happened. It's it happened. Happens. Yeah, it's almost like you have to have spares and it's hard to, hard to do that. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're sending me, they said a loner. Um, I just don't know when. So I've. Brooke, what, this is probably a silly question, but what do you do with your wheelchair? I mean, do you, do you have, you have yours just broken? Do you have to send it in? So it still drives. So they let me hold on to it. Um, it's just not fitted right anymore so like the back somehow is like four inches lower than it used to be i think it just got like crunched so they, they mm. dropped it off the ramp it, like loading it onto the plane it just went, and it's like 400 pounds so it's a big a big tree fall hard and so the like the arms are messed everything is slightly broken on it but it still drives so i was like oh i can probably just like wait until they get the new parts in but they told me the parts aren't coming for like a week and a half so i told them mm. send over the loner at this point my head hurts yeah. but i got a heavy head apparently like it needs to be held up this and the you'll see it's so low for me i'm like looking up all the time i'm trying to think what you could do like jerry rig it for a week. i bought like a neck pillow and i've been using that but it it's like an airplane pillow so i was like i'm not gonna wear it on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> You could if you wanted to. But. Yeah, I don't think you guys would judge me, but I don't think I would want to watch it back. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, you got that's a muscle you gotta use all day long, hearing, holding your head up. Yeah. Merritt, what are the most exciting medical advancements being worked on right now? But there's a couple of companies targeting TDP forty three, other ones the nuclear pore. Um there's still like a ton of companies working on AOS, which is exciting. But it does seem like it's a time where they're all having a hard time getting, you know, venture capital funds and stuff. There's there's a lot of wasted time for like fund fundraising. So I I don't know the solution for it, but I, I think you know, I know I know there's a lot of federal funding now for ALS, but we might need more. Um, so we don't we don't want these companies to go away. Yeah, how much do you feel like each company needs like I, I guess I don't know the financials closely enough I know what the government gives what 200 million to ALS more I think 200 million, uh, 200 200, million. well so it, like a phase three trial like a, is to be 80 to 100 million dollars and that's like the last trial um, but they but well, but the, at that point they would get like investors for it because it would have a proven track record, right? Or no? Yeah, but that, that's where the problem is now. It seems like a lot of the investors are, are investing in, not just in ALS, but in, you know, drug development in general. We just see there's a lot of good companies out there that have some positive data in, in ALS, but they, um, they're struggling to raise that the, the money for the, the pivotal trial. And that, that can sometimes take two or three years. And, you know, we could have been done with the trial by then. So that seems to be one of the current problems. What costs so much? I don't understand. Like, I'm trying to back into $100 million for a phase three. What is it that costs yeah. the most? So, yeah, it's a really good question. We should have a whole podcast on why trials cost, and drug development cost so much. But part of it is, is obviously going to pay for the, the drug, right? So they got to make the drug and they got to make the placebo. And then there's all these, these contract research organizations that, you know, you know, train the sites and monitor that the data is well, and that it, it, you know, the data meets all the criteria. Um, you have to, you know, pay the sites to do the work. So that's like the nurses and stuff. So it, it just keeps adding up. And then you have to do safety labs. And so there's a lab that for that, you have a research pharmacy, it's just the, lots of pieces to it and lots of rules you have to follow. Mm-hmm. And the prices just keep going up. Like no one says, let's get rid of these five rules so you can simplify. It's, more, it's the opposite. Like, you know, there's more and more rules. And so you have to keep hiring more people to follow the rules and it keeps getting more and more expensive. Mm-hmm. And that's, 
That's kind of, it's, it's a, it's a good segue into it. That's kind of what caused, like led you to the master platform trial, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we saw all these, these uh, drugs out there for ALS and, um, and if you tested them each, each one at a time, we'd be here forever. So the idea of a platform trial is to share those costs, those kind of fixed costs, you know, between multiple uh, drug companies um, and cut the cost in half, um, share placebo data, you know, sh share um, the costs at the sites. So, so the, these platform trials have been studying cancer and that costs, it costs about a third less and it's about 50% faster and it's better for patients. So there are more people on drug. So we're, we're really excited about it. I mean, it, it, we, we launched it with the help from Tackle ALS and a couple other foundations and um, we're on our seventh drug. It's exciting. And, and there's many other groups now in, in neurodegeneration that want to do the same thing. So like anytime a field finally ha knows enough about the illness that they have lots of drugs, you know, the, the platform trials make sense. So there's, there's now a platform trial in Parkinson's, there's one in Alzheimer's and, and um, stroke and traumatic brain injury. So it's, um, the, the, the approach is, has really like taken off. We're very proud of the Healy ALS platform trial. Can you please tell us about both the good and the bad from Tackle ALS's season one? I think it's important that people hear exactly where the money they donated went. We don't want it to be a PR clip. We want it to be very transparent, including both highlights as well as the setbacks. So season one of Tackle ALS has supported the, the Healy ALS platform trial. I think the good is that it, it, it happened. You know, it's a first platform trial on ALS and we've tested seven drugs. We have the results of five. Uh, of the first five, two were, had some positive results and are going forward to the next phase. Uh, that's uh, with clean nanomedicine and prolenia. But three, three of the first five didn't work. I don't know if that's bad, but it's obviously we would want all of them to work. But we got you know fast answers on those. The other two we're going to find out um, in in uh, by the end of this year, hopefully. Um, and then we have about four more that will start next year. I'd say the 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 good is that it's it's just it's just great. It's very good for the patients, good for the community. Um, there was so much interest in this trial to be part of it. And this is maybe one of the bad things is that we found that this, the hospitals or the, the centers where people were going to do the trials, they couldn't keep up with the patient interest. And so we were hearing that people with ALS were being told that they had to wait three or four months to get into the trial. And I, I think that's bad. Um, so that's another problem we're trying to solve now to try to see how, how can we um, support sites in a way that they never tell somebody that they have to wait three or four months. How, how long would it have taken to test seven drugs if we didn't have the master platform trial? Well, we did seven drugs in um, three years. It would, have taken pro it would have taken probably at least double that, I think about seven years. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's much faster. Of course, we, we need to get better drugs. As we get better drugs, more of them will be successful. But but I'm you know happy that two out of the five were, were, were you know at least moving on to the next phase. Why is Tackle ALS focused on repair and regeneration for season two? You know, I'm very excited about season two, um, and and the reason we want to focus on repair and regeneration um, is because we now know it's it's possible. I mean, when we talk to obviously our patients and our, our people we know with ALS. They don't want us just to slow down the illness. It's about, can you return function? Can you stop progression? And now we know from these gene therapy trials that it's actually possible. So we want to understand that science and help develop some drugs that are focused on return of function and repair. So that, that's what season two is about. How many drugs are we doing in season two, Merritt? Well, there, there's at least two companies already with repair drugs. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do another five or six um, in season two. But we, we, there's at least two already that are, um, you know, card carrying, what I call card carrying repair drugs. Um, I can, I mean, those are public. So the one is with the company Curalis and another one with the company Spinogenics. Uh, they're both working on approaches that can, you know, hopefully repair function. Do you think we will be able to eventually prevent people from ever getting ALS? 
Also, do you think we will be able to repair and return function to people like Brooke and I that already have it? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think that one's going to take a little, maybe a little longer, but it's already starting in, you know, people who carry one of the genes, this gene SOD1, there's a trial with a, with a gene therapy to try to prevent onset. And, you know, what they learn there hopefully can help us understand maybe how to, how to think about preventing the, the non-genetic form as well. But it's going to happen. I like to call it, we're going to prevent, we're going to stop and then reverse. That, that's going to be the theme. And, and you just might need different people and different sources of funds for it, all of that. So it can, it can happen in parallel. Brooke, last time you were on the podcast, you mentioned you didn't think you would want to get a tracheotomy. I know this is extremely personal, but it's also the Nothing Left Unsaid podcast. So I have to ask, is that still the case? Or um, have you changed your stance on it? You both made a very good case for getting one last time. I don't I, I don't think I've updated anything in my like five wishes. Um, I think it's gonna be something I have to decide as it gets closer. Like I, I don't think I can really envision anything in the future at this point because like I don't want to. I don't want to picture what I'm gonna be like in a year or five years or more likely a year or two years. Um, and yeah, I, I haven't really pictured it yet. So I'm a maybe. Hard maybe. Hard maybe. <laughs> a hard maybe is a lot better than a no. Merritt, when you were talking about like all of this funding needed, what can like lay people do? Is it just like donate tackle ALS? Are there other, like, should we be banging down the doors of these like VC firms? Like what, what should we be doing? It, that's such a good question. I think there's lots, lots of people can do. You know, obviously one is, is to support uh, groups like tackle ALS or other groups. Another obviously is, is to be part of the trials and, and that that's for people with ALS, but also people without it can be part of the, the other research where, you know, donate, blood or donate uh, even urine or, you know, to understand, the, you know, help us understand the illness. And then there's the whole advocacy part that you're talking about, banging down the doors of either the government, probably both the government and the VCs. I think um, I've seen how impactful it is when people with ALS talk to drug companies and they understand the disease that they're trying to develop a drug for and they understand what's, what's important. And that's happening a lot. But I love your idea of doing the same with the VCs. You know, and, and that, that might be a really great thing that we could do. Yeah. Just going to go on LinkedIn, start prospecting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really a good idea. You know, it's, you know, these things come in waves. You know, the, the, what would happen to be in a wave, it seems right now, where, where it's, it's hard for these smaller companies to raise the funds they need. It just delays things. Is that because, like, has it gotten harder because of, like, uh, not to place 100% of blame, but, like, the Amalex thing, when it got pulled back, obviously, like, I would imagine investors lost money. Like, does that hurt future funding or does not really affect it? It's just, like, people don't really want to invest in ALS at all. I think it's, it's, it's probably a couple things. That, that certainly did, did cause, a, a, like, a pause. Uh, of thinking that maybe this is this is harder harder than 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 people thought you know before that, but it's it's not isolated to ALS. It's it's yeah. um, you know it, it's in a lot of neurological illnesses. And... Mm. I don't know why that sounds comforting. I'm like, oh, good, but obviously it's not good. Brooke, if you ever want to talk about the trait privately, please call me. I hope you never have to, but if you get to the point where you must make that decision and aren't sure. I want you to promise that you'll call me to talk about it. I will. I will. It's good to have like someone that you can talk to about these things who's living it. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that was really interesting and in, when Brooke first came on the podcast that we, we got a lot of like comments on or messages about is my dad and Brooke are kind of on either like Brooke's more on the early side and my dad's more on the later side. And it was kind of, like the, it was very interesting you guys talking about it to each other. Cause like Brooke could ask questions and my dad's 
made those decisions and been through those things. It was cool. Yeah. Mm. I don't feel like I'm early stages anymore. Like I just, I feel like the things that work for me are very like outward facing. Like my voice works, my facial expressions work, my hands, like I can still move them, but like, I can't like lift my arm anymore. So I think like on zoom, I come across like I haven't progressed at all. And that's kind of tricky on social media too. Cause I have to be like, no, like it's very different below the neck. Um, cause I like nothing feels like it's working anymore except for my voice at times. It's similar. We had a uh, Aaron Lazar on and I'm like, you don't look like you even have ALS. Yeah. And he's he's like, yeah, if I – and he said the same thing. He's like, I need a walker. I need all – but it's kind of a similar situation where it's like how the order in which you're, uh, it progresses like really matters to how it's perceived from the outside. Yeah. How many followers do you have an outbreak if I can ask? Um, I ask. On, on TikTok, I'm at like 170,000. On Instagram, I think I'm at a hundred and twenty something thousand. Yeah, I've had people in clinic tell me, you know, the family members that they listen to you and they follow yeah. you and how how much it helps them. That's I mean, so that, nice. that, that's what I was wondering because it, it it happens so many times that people have told me that that I think you're really yeah. you're up. Yeah, niche niche celebrity in a very niche community. <laughs> Like, I'm like, oh, I'm huge in the ALS world, guys. I'm huge there. Don't worry about it. It is definitely, but it is really important because I, same thing, Merritt. I've had a lot of people say to me like, oh, you got to check out Brooke. I feel like people with ALS are probably sick of that. They're probably like, we know. <laughs> All we hear is that girl talking. I think it's the more, the more uh, people kind of fighting for people with ALS, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Brooke, your voice is not only important, but needed in the ALS community. Merritt, can you please tell people about Tackle ALS? So uh, Tackle ALS, uh, uh, first of all, the funds go uh, straight to research. Um, Season one was about the platform trial and and getting drugs uh, in trials to people living with ALS. And season two is, again, 100% for research uh, on repair and regeneration. Um, you can make your team there. Um, there's ways to bring in your friends. Um, and, and you get to see a great video by Tim at the, at the opening of it. But it's really, it's a phenomenal um, uh, season one and two. And it's really doing, I hope, a lot of good to help develop new therapies for people. I like the branding of season one, season two. I feel yeah. like I'm starting a good show, you know? Yeah. Season that two was kind always of the, gets more budget than season one on TV. So hopefully it's the same. Right, we got to get it going. It's like yeah. people, when we first started it, there was like, there was a lot of competition to get like on the, the top 10 teams like displayed on the front page of the website. And so there was a lot of competition to get on the front page. And then once people got on there, like it's the numbers started getting really big. So people couldn't like join and break into that. So we reset it, but we haven't had as much truthfully, haven't had as much, there's a lot more grassroots in season one where people were making $5 or $10 donations. This season has been a lot more like big, bigger, uh, bigger donations, which is great, obviously too, but. You could do like a, I do like a $5 challenge from time to time when I feel like I've fatigued my followers of asking them to donate, which I, I do like multiple fundraisers a year. So I feel like at a certain point, people are probably like, oh, my God, she's asking again. So for my birthday this past year, I did like a $5 challenge. And I feel like if you tell people the amount, it takes away a lot of the awkwardness of donating. Because sometimes you see what people give and you're like, if I only give $5, I'm going to look like a jerk. So I'm just not going to give anything at all. So I tell yeah. people, I'm like, just give five. And then everyone just starts piling in. So you should do like a $5 challenge and do it on like, well, today's the fifth. You could do a $6 challenge tomorrow. Like you could make it for no reason at all, you know? It was also important to us that Tackle ALS have a 0% admin fee on all our donations. We also believe strongly in the idea of ALS patients getting better. 
and not just regressing at a slower pace. Yeah, so technical AOS, uh, 100% of the funds go straight to research. So there's no admin fees. Um, and uh, it, it's really focused on developing new treatments for people with AOS. Um, and season two is all about repair and regeneration drugs and therapy. What should a listener do if they or someone they know have symptoms or are diagnosed with ALS? I'd say, I mean, first thing um, is to really get to a good ALS center and, and uh, to find a team that, that you like and you trust that can help you with this. And there are a lot of good, good places out there. That, that's just one. And then there are medications that you can start right away. There's things to help with the symptoms. There's trials just to start to learn about things. And then to the other thing is, you know, there's just amazing communities out, out there that are helping people with ALS and being a community. And, and Brooke can probably expand much more on that, but um, just know that you're not alone. Yeah, I always tell people don't Google, but if you want to search on the internet, just go to rune, R-O-O-N.com. Merritt and I are both on there. I don't know if the greens are. I think they've tried to get you guys and you've been like, yeah, big timing them a little bit, um, but I'm obsessed timing. with that team. They they pulled a bunch of us from the ALS community and just asked us a bunch of questions, and so you get answers. Like if you can't travel to Boston to see Merritt, you can see her answers on Rune and hear like what she recommends and what her thoughts are. So I always direct people there as opposed to Google because at least there is a lot more like sympathy, empathy. I never know the difference between those two. Thank you both for coming on the podcast today. I think you have two of the most important voices in all of ALS, and it's crucial to keep people updated on changes. I appreciate both of your time and more than just this podcast. Thank you for all you do in the ALS community. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You too, too. Thanks to Troy and Brooke. Yeah, we'll have to do this again. Next one, we'll, we'll be giving uh, the results. We'll have to tell, talk about the results of repair and regeneration drugs. I think yep. you were going to say the results yep. of like the feedback of this episode. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you guys your results next time, your grades. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go over all the metrics. So, Thank you, guys. guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com. Thank you.